Hi, Yusreen. Hi, nice to see you all. Hello. Hi, Claire. Hello, Robin. Hello, Esther. Hi, Esther. Mm -hmm. um, I think we also have Emerald and Ifai. Hi, everyone. Let me boost. That's actually my painting. Is it really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's nice. Really nice. Yeah. So when I get bored, I just clean my chair around. <laughs> I, get, I get my paint brushes and then I start to do that. <laughs> oh, sure. Very nice. Thank you. An aquarium, actually. <laughs> wow. I actually thought so, right? Very nice. Yes. I'm I'm impressed. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's soothing after we've had yeah. some scotch at, at um, mediation. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, good, perfect. That's that's what we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> Great. Looking forward to that. Good good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Okay. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and I've got my slides pulled up. Um, and what I was thinking was, how about, um, how about I take the first 45 minutes or so and and just go through some of the material. But then I was thinking, let's take um let's take the last 15 minutes-ish and you know, and just have a conversation and just chime in with questions and talk through from our personal experiences, what's working and what's not working, and what are some tips we can share. Um I I think. I think that makes sense. There's such a team of experts here that it would be great for us, for us all to spend some time sharing our thoughts. So that's what I was thinking. Um, Yutunda, I'm not sure if I can mute you. There we go, okay. Okay, all right, so I'm going to dive in and get started, but please, um, Please interrupt me <laughs> whenever whenever we have questions or there's something that we should spend more time on. Um, I I would love for this to be more of an interactive conversation. So so please jump in and let's talk through all of this. All right. So so I wanted to to discuss today was um, how we can enjoy this process how we can enjoy mediating online. I know at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of people who said, oh, I guess I'll figure this out. I guess I'll, I'll do what I can to make this work just while I have to. But I think we've realized now that first off, it's probably going to last longer than a couple of weeks. And second, that there are actually a lot of opportunities with mediating online. So that's where I wanted to focus. Just what are the... What are the pluses from it and how can we make this, how can we make this a process that we enjoy? Something, an experience that is, is beneficial for us as well as our clients. So the first thing I want to focus on is, is us. We'll get to our clients and how we can make this a great mediation experience for them in a moment. But first let's let's focus on us, the mediators. Um some of the reasons why I think that this is working for us now as mediators is first, Zoom makes it really easy. <laughs> Thank goodness, WhatsApp, Zoom, Digital Samba, there's so much great technology out there. Uh, I think I've mentioned to you the last time I got to speak with you that about five years ago, I began mediating online. And it, just because we live way out in the country and I got sick of driving everywhere, so I, I started figuring out how to mediate online and it was, it was horrible, wasn't it? <laughs> Just the technology that we had back then, it was hard. 
Okay, now now download this. Okay, do you have this permission? Okay, now do you see your webcam? Okay, but try, do you see any kind of a webcam? Like it was clunky and it was frustrating for all of us. So thank goodness now, Zoom has made this a lot easier. But I think the other thing that has made this so much easier that has made online mediation really work right now is our kids. Our kids that are constantly texting and sharing every possible detail they can on the phone and they're they are sharing way too much information online. Um, I don't know. It's it's hard sometimes to go with my kids' social media accounts. I'm like, you feel comfortable telling that to complete strangers, but they do. They they've paved the way for us for sharing a lot of very vulnerable information online. And okay, I still have to get my kids in trouble a little bit, but for our clients. What it means is that they're now comfortable sharing information. They're, they're comfortable being vulnerable and sharing intimate things. And again, five years ago, I don't think that was true. Um, people, people weren't comfortable opening up. And that's, I think when we, when we push everything else to the side, like, oh, are you using Zoom? What about your webcam? What about your bandwidth? When we push all of that to the side, I think what really makes mediation work is just that safe place where you have somebody who's listening and somebody who feels safe enough to share what's important to them. And so now that the technology and the social norm is there, I think we've recreated that magic of mediation where we can be completely present and our clients can feel safe and heard. Okay, so let's look at some more specifics. So I'm going to talk about four things here today. This is my online plan. We will talk about the process, the length, uh, what we need to be aware of when we're online versus face-to-face, -face, and just how we can normalize this process, okay? So those four pieces. So I want to begin with process um, and specifically look at uh, how we can grow during this process, how we can, how we can take this as an opportunity to re-examine how are we mediating. Um, it's been really interesting at mediate.com. We keep hearing people that say, oh, I had a process and it worked and I was making money and I'm not going to change that process. Okay. Well, it, it probably used to make you money, but if people aren't willing to change and adapt to how things are working now and what clients really need, then, then we're just doing a disservice to our clients, right? We're not helping them. And so it's so fascinating because all of the mediators that used to be booked months and months in advance are suddenly finding that their client base is really dwindling. And all of the mediators that are, that are young, scrappy, and hungry, and they would, they will do whatever it takes. They will find the, the latest in technology. They will meet with somebody early on a Saturday morning or they will fit it into chunks while their clients' kids are sleeping. So people that are willing to be more flexible and work with clients on their client's schedule, they're the ones whose practices are just exploding these last few months. And, and I, I don't know, I, I think that's really interesting. And I think that that's a lesson that we all can learn um, how to not just use Zoom, but more than that, what is, what is the right process for mediating online? How can we change our approach? How should our clients change their approach? Um, because I think, uh, I think when, we, um, when we mediate online and we're just trying to take the face-to-face -face process and squish it into Zoom, it doesn't really work, right? You can tell that clients feel feel a little rushed, like they're not completely heard, and we're not taking advantage of everything that we have online, okay? So let's look at what our process used to be when we were face-to-face. -face. Uh, we would have these long sessions, right? We could have four-hour sessions, eight-hour sessions. I could give lots of verbal validation. So for instance, if Robin was one of my clients, then while he was speaking, I could say, oh, mm -hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. I can't do that anymore, right? Because with Zoom, only one person gets to share audio at a time. Um, I would also give these really long explanatory paragraphs when I was doing my, my mediator statement. Um,
space for eight hours instead I would be looking out the window and I would get some tea and I would make notes and I would get up and move around. And so your brain was constantly being stimulated and re-engaged. Okay, so that's how things used to look. So now, um, now we are just not getting that, that time as mediators. We're not getting all of those breaks where we can look out the window and we can get tea and we can look away from our client's face. So before we go any farther into process, I want to talk about us as mediators, because this isn't something that we spend a lot of time on, is our own mediator health. Um, the first few months when everything moved online, I was like, oh, this is great. I don't have to drive anywhere. I need maybe 30 seconds in between my meetings, and that's it. And I would just schedule them back to back to back all day long. The problem was that I was treating myself like a robot. And so that's what my clients were getting, right? They were just getting a robot who didn't have any emotions and I wasn't fully present. And by the end of the day, my brain was nothing. It was just this big pile of applesauce. And I couldn't be as present with my clients as they deserved. And it, actually, it, it took me a little while to figure this out that all of the things that I had been taking for granted were the things that allowed your brain to recharge and relax and, and look away from the, from the client's immediate problems and get a little bit of objectivity and see some context to what's happening with them. Um, and, it, and they were just the little things, like I would be I would take 10 minutes to drive somewhere and listen to my favorite song, or I would be waiting in the parking lot and have a conversation with my friend or walk around the block while I was trying to find the building. Just these little moments that, that I had completely taken for granted, but I've now realized those were the moments that allowed my brain to step away from the conflict, take a break from the screen and, and be energized enough to take on the next mediation. Um, so even though we can't schedule, let's have a moment of inspiration. What we can do is prepare for it. We can take moments to say, all right, what is it that my brain needs to be fully recharged so that I can, so I can be at my best for my clients by the end of the day? And, you know, we've been talking about this a lot the last six months or so as we've realized, oh, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. And mental exhaustion and screen exhaustion is a real thing. So we've talked about the science behind it, but I don't know about you, I hadn't really done anything proactive about it. So this is a little bossy, but I have young kids and so I get to be bossy. It's just my nature right now. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is to just think about how can you put that in your schedule? How can you prioritize yourself? How can you change the process so that you're not treating yourself like a robot, but that you can say, no, my, my clients actually is me at my best. So that means I'm going to take five minutes in between meetings. I'm going to take 20 minutes and go on a walk or dig in the garden or beautiful fish. How can you make sure that you're scheduling that time for yourself? Um, and we'll talk about the psychology behind that in just a moment about why this is so important. But the first thing I, I'm going to ask you to do is just think about how you can schedule that. So I've put, a, I've put an alarm on my watch that every hour it dings and it says, okay, get up, look away from the computer, get up and do something physical so that you're grounded and recharged for your next meeting. Um, so... I encourage you to take a moment and think about what that looks like for yourself. And again, actually put it on your calendar or write a note to yourself or do something that says, all right, my, my mental recharging is important enough that I'm going to schedule. Okay. Um, I don't think I have muting capabilities. I'm not sure if somebody else does. Nope. Okay. All right, there we go. All right. So that's the first little bit that I, I want to encourage you to do when you're thinking about changing the process online. 
um, make sure that you're taking time for yourself, you know, make sure that you're taking time to, to be fully present with your clients. Because again, I think that's what makes mediation so magical. That's what makes dispute resolution this incredibly powerful process is that you are fully present. And that's something that a lot of people haven't had before. And that's why they got to this point. So just being able to say, I am grounded enough. I am at peace. I, I am not worried and distracted about all these other things, but I can just be here with you and give you that gift of my attention. I think that's, that's what people deserve. So, so I think we need to be a little bit more proactive about setting ourselves up for that. All right. So the next thing that we need to do when we change the process online is I get everything shorter. I would love to hear from all of you. Is, has this been your experience as well? Um, there is no way that I could go, especially, and my clients couldn't go for a four-hour session anymore or an eight-hour session. It just, it's, it's us to try to do that online. So instead, um, my calendar has just become crazy because I have all these little bits and pieces in there now where I'm just scheduling these very short conversations but wow, we're getting so much more done. And they're, they're very dynamic, exciting sessions because instead of knowing that we have four hours to fully talk through something, now and I'm doing these four one hour sessions where we just focus on one issue at a time. And then I really have my clients at their best. They're staying excited and engaged and they're, they're fully present through the whole process. Um, the other thing that I've changed with meeting online is I'm always having some kind of an AV test beforehand. Um, even with clients that are completely comfortable with Zoom and they say, oh, I've got this. I don't need to check my, my camera. Well, I'm being sneaky here because I'm telling them that it's an AV test. But what it really is, is me trying to build rapport with them before we start actually mediating. So I'm trying to establish some kind of a connection with them through the screen and letting them know, hey, I'm a real person. I have a heart and a brain, and I really care what you have to say. And I'm modeling that by saying, how can we make this process more comfortable for you? How can we make sure that, that you are heard and that you are engaged? How much time should we spend? Should we plan on some private sessions? How can we really make this work for you? And I'm showing them right from the beginning, I really care what you have to say. And I think that is the main purpose of this five minute AV test. Yeah, I, I am gonna make sure that their audio and their visual work. And I might talk about breakout rooms and some other features, but the, the big purpose here is that I want my clients to feel heard and connected with me. And I don't want them to have to worry about mediating on. Um, even if they've had other Zoom conversations, they might not have had a Zoom mediation. And I don't want them to have to be concerned about this, right? They have enough other stuff going on in their life to be concerned about. So if we can get one of these fears off of their shoulders, then they're able to be um, a little bit more present to just focus on their dispute. So I'll have that quick session, then I'll just have some private sessions then we'll do joint sessions. But again, I'm scheduling a lot of these um, instead of just one long session, I'm scheduling a lot of long, I'm sorry, I'm scheduling a lot of shorter sessions. And gosh, my, I, I have to tell you, my clients really seem to be appreciating it. And I do as well. I, I think that I can do a better job when we're just focusing on smaller issues um, and having these shorter sessions. And then, I'm also scheduling an agreement signing session at the very end. And this is nice. It's our closure. We talk about next steps, how we're going to work with each other going forward. And we'll often just sign the document right there in Zoom. So I just use remote control to sign the document, or I might send it up to a hello sign or Panda Docs or something. And we'll just sign it right there instead of all of the back and forth and the scanning and everything. So um, that's, that is how my process has changed, but I want to check in with all of you. What have you noticed? Has, 
Have your meetings shortened? Are you seeing more of them or a different type of meetings? What do you think? I'm putting you all on the spot a little bit here, I realize. Well, Claire, um, I have hardly had to handle private mediations. Um, yeah. A lot of mediations I've done have been um, referred from court connected. Um, usually such part parties have their lawyers with them mm -hmm. and it's treated so officially yeah. that um, it, it's, Sometimes it's a lot of the work we have to do yeah. is to calm both down and get tempers to come down a bit. That's mm -hmm. between the participants. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the councils are being so professional and uh, standing their grounds. And so um, they would rather prefer a total adjournment. Mm -hmm. But I have found out that in some instances where I know I have the CEOs or decision makers around. Sure. Uh, what I've done in such a situation was to start off with the lawyers and let them trade punches. And uh, after it gets real wild, mm -hmm. I ask for a break and then send the two chief executives into a breakout room. Uh -huh. Send the lawyers into a separate breakout room and all that. The lawyers continue to trade punches, but the chief executive now see that they're in for a long haul mm -hmm. and uh, they just settle. I love so, it. Well, once, once, you, once they've settled and you bring them back to plenary, the lawyers are going to object, but you now <laughs> calmly let them know that it's not about them or their professionalism. It's about <laughs> the parties and the parties want to settle. So <laughs> I say, but breaks between um mediation sessions i haven't had a lot of experience with that i would love it but <laughs> and the i've also noticed that i can't leave my clients in a breakout room as long as i could leave them in a conference room have you noticed that as well yes you can leave them in, yeah Right. Actually, the particular one, I'm, uh, the, the one that I found most interesting, the minute I joined the uh, chief executives, they just said, look, we need, we need to get out of here. Huh. So in a way, leaving them a little longer than they wanted to added to the urgency to resolve. Got it. I love I'm it. I'm not sure that's a good strategy, but it worked. <laughs> but it worked. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin. Yeah. Well, my own almost following the same line with um, what has been said, most of it is time-based. Although I could have uh, two or three sessions, I've actually had three sessions in a day of different matters, uh, but it's always time-based, like uh, during the opening statements and the rules, I try as much as possible to say, look, can you put yourself there? Well, he was interrupted. Uh, so I, I I could do 9 to nine to 11, 1 to 3, mm -hmm. then 5 to 7. Mm -hmm. So I schedule my appointments based on that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I'll just say, okay, uh, today, yes, I'm free. What time would you like to have this? I say, one to three. So, start off time is one o'clock, three, three o'clock, we're getting off. So, by the time I'm doing opening statements, I'm telling them that uh, by the time I'm laying the ground rules, I say, we're doing this thing from one o'clock to three o'clock. So, so Apart from bringing them into breakout rooms and all that, when you need to have private sessions, um, because of the shortness of two hours, we never really agree mm. to any sort of break. You you, mm -hmm. you can't tell them, oh, gentlemen, please, we want to stretch our legs. Are you all ready to stretch your legs now? You know, because mm -hmm. it's two hours. So, yeah. So, most of my matters are really scheduled matters. 
Mm -hmm. you know, it's not really private session things or like training. Sure. I, I, if I was into training, we could go from like uh, um, in the morning, let's say we're starting this training, it's 9 to 3 o'clock too. Then you can then be say, okay, uh, when it's 11 o'clock, we're going to have a tea break. When you say, you know, but all the ones I've had, they're all scheduled appointments. Mm -hmm. If A versus B, I mean, like, like I just had one uh, today. I knew we we're going to have a five o'clock. So I already said, look, I'm doing one to three because I'm going into somewhere at five. You know, so, and then that's it. So occasionally it may, it may flow to another time. It may flow out of okay. the three o'clock. Uh -huh. But generally yeah. it doesn't go beyond 15 minutes, especially where you're having opportunity that they're going to set to. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. yeah. So you may, you may just say, okay, all right, let's see how it goes. Three, 15 minutes extra, you know, do you have something more to add? Something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you still going to That's think good. about it? Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. but I've, not, I've not had the luxury, really, of uh, having a session, then say, oh, we're going to have a tea break in 30 minutes time. We're going to, you know, because most of the time they are dispute related, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, like yeah. the one I just had now today, it's got to do, it's a money matter, it's a finance issue. You know, somebody's owing, is owing the bank, and the bank are coming up with their requirements. And he's also saying this is what you can do, and all that, and all that. So, right. you know, there's a bit of conflict. There are cases of conflict, you know. So if you say you're going to have a tea break or you're going to go off there, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's angry. The bank is angry that you're owing me, and you're telling him that the man wants to go and break. They are more angry. Yeah. You know, so yeah, but that's just where I find myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I believe that what you're saying will go down well with if you are doing a training training session. I've not been lucky. Absolutely. I've not been yeah, yeah. I've not been lucky to have that. Right. Not you know nobody has invited me to come and do lectures or something like that. Right. You know, so, um, right. And I do want to point out that when, um, one second, Josephine, when we are taking those breaks, so if we, if we have a deviation and then we wait a week and we have the next session, that I'm making sure to, to keep notes and, and sometimes we will even have them sign an agreement that just says, this is how we agree to treat each other because I don't want to lose track of all the work that we've done. And I don't want the clients to feel like we're not making any progress. So I will often have them sign something that says, hey, we haven't settled every issue, but for the next week, this is what the parenting plan looks like, or this is um, how we will work together on a project, something like that. Uh, Josephine, what were you going to say? Um, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Oh, thank um, you. I'm, I'm probably going to speak on the part of Kenya and what I've seen from our practice. Mm -hmm. So we are a 2 center and we offer an online dispute resolution platform. So essentially we're on the tech end of things, but we've okay. recruited uh, dispute resolution professionals who work uh, on a need to basis. So if there's a mediation, they're called to, um, to mediate arbitration and so on and so forth. So what we've seen is, we've seen a, an instance where everyone just has to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of our panelists really are people who are holding not only full-time jobs, but some are also doing this as a full hustle. So I, I, I'm seeing a change in schedule. Uh, and as Utatuzi, we've also had to have a lot of technical support because you can have a, a mediation happen at around 6 to 8 p.m. because it is just the time where everyone happens to be available. And because now we're yeah. offering the tech and we have to be alive there for the support, there's nothing much we can do yep. uh, other than we're... to try out to work around, to work around it. Yeah. Um, so far, so good. At least majority of them happen within the day. 
Mm -hmm. But uh, also in the Kenyan perspective, we have a, our mediation uh, rules allow for a certain number of a certain number of episodes to happen, of sessions rather, to happen within a certain time frame. So you can also prolong it uh, because within five to six mediation sessions, your, your, your case should either be concluded or escalated either to court or to arbitration or to something else. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's it from me. Yeah, thank you. And Josephine, that was the perfect um, that was the perfect introduction for this next piece, which is just realizing that that right now clients are busy and they are distracted and they are at home and there are a lot of other things going on. And so I really like just honoring that and beginning the mediation by saying, "What can we do to really help you focus?" And they might say. Well, my kids are playing outside and I would like to go check on them every 10, 10 minutes or so. And if that means that your client can be completely focused for 10 minutes and then they just have to look out the window every now and then, I think that's great. Instead of, no, you have to sit here and you have to focus for the next three hours and realizing that your client is going to be completely distracted because they're worried about their kids or they have to do something else because when you're at home it just means that your your focus might need to be a little bit more it might be shorter and or you might only be able to focus like what josephine was saying at six to eight when um when everybody else in the house is doing something else or when um, people have finally stepped away from work and they're able to focus on this and so so that's incredible josephine that that you have already realized that um, again, I think that's what a lot of mediators that have been calling mediate.com have realized as well, that if they are willing to meet with their clients early on a Saturday morning or late on a Thursday night, that they are really getting their clients at their best instead of trying to fit it into a time when their clients are just too distracted to focus. So thank you. Okay. Um, uh, so how, so there is a lot of technology out there, right? There are a lot of different options and a lot of ways that people have, have um, tried to integrate technology into their practice. But I think what really helps our clients is if we can keep it as short and sweet as possible. In other words, um, uh, how, can we, how can we just make this clear and simple for them? And so, for instance, I don't let Zoom send out an invite because it's really confusing. The Zoom invite has so many different links and phone numbers on it that I can tell I'm just adding to my client's frustration. So instead, I have come up with my own very short little invite that just says, hi, here's what time we're meeting. Here's the link. That's it. And the more we can make this a very simple process for them. Um, I know some people have come up with a short video, just a 30 second video that says, here is the process, you will click here, we'll send you the documents via email, and then we will be done. Just something to make this a, a very simple process because for a lot of people, this is still scary. Um, again, even if they use Zoom before, they haven't mediated with Zoom before. So they're just wondering how it's going to work. Um, so yes, I've been talking about shortening the sessions when you can, I think it really helps. And the other thing that I think really helps our clients is to keep it a little sweeter. Um, and I have found that I need to keep the process a little bit lighter when I'm mediating online than when I was face-to-face. -face. Um, again, I'm not sure if other people have experienced this, but I think what's going on, I wanna skip to another slide here. I'll come back to these. Is, where is this slide? There it is. Um, that when our clients are face-to-face, -face, we can pick up on a lot of little triggers and cues that let us know things are escalating but we miss a lot of those clients when, or I'm sorry, we miss a lot of those cues when we're online. So um, think about when we are mediating with a client and we're face to face with them, what are some of the things that would let you know that that client is frustrated? 
well, they're probably going to tap their foot, right? Or they might be tapping a pen against their knee, or you can see they're tightening their stomach or they're tightening their shoulders or they're tapping thing on the table. So right now I am doing every one of those things and you can't see it, right? So what's frustrating is all of those cues that we could have picked up on if we're sitting across the conference table, we're missing. So what I have realized is that when I finally do get a clue that says, oh, this person is very upset, they are getting very triggered, that they are probably much more escalated than I've realized. They have probably already become much more triggered and, and upset. Um, then if we were face to face, I would be able to jump in much sooner and I can gauge that a little bit more and I can know how far I can push them. But when we're online, I don't feel like I can push them quite as far because they're already much more escalated than I know. So that's why I'm saying I try to keep things a little bit sweeter and a little bit lighter. And when, um, when I can tell that clients are getting triggered, I'll immediately pause, we'll move into a breakout room and I'll, I'll just check in with them. How's everything going? Can I just take the pulse of the mediation? Um, is there anything that we need to talk about? And sometimes, you know, I've completely misread the signals and they've said, no, everything's fine. But I would still, I still want to check in with them um, just because I have to be honest that I am not picking up on as many signals as I would be otherwise. So if we let it go too far, now I'll go back to these. Um, if we let it go too far and our clients do become very triggered, that's unfortunately when their amygdala takes over. So I just want to talk about our brain for a second and how this is working in an online environment. So, um, so typically we want our clients to be operating from their prefrontal cortex, right? So if you hold up your hand, and you pull your thumb in, this is like your amygdala, okay? They're like two little olives that live back here behind your ears. And the amygdala um, is, what, is what tells you what to do in times of conflict. When there's danger, when there's a mountain lion about to attack you, your amygdala takes over. This is not where you want your clients to be when they are mediating. So you want your clients to be operating from here from the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is what allows your clients to think about their goals, to think logically about how to achieve a good relationship, what steps and what compromises and what logical strategies I can make now. And your prefrontal cortex allows you to be a little bit creative and to think of additional solutions. Um, when you're operating from your amygdala, the amygdala, remember, that's the one that takes over when you become very triggered. Your amygdala is very myopic. It only, it's like it has tunnel vision and it only can see one thing that will help you. It's as if, it's as if your clients have stuck their nose right in the corner and they're not seeing anything else. And they just think, I have to get out of this room. I have to have this conflict be over. I need things to be done. And our job is to help our clients to, to calm down enough that their prefrontal cortex re-engages and it's as if they're stepping out of the corner and looking around and seeing, okay, I'm all right, I'm all right. Um, so of course this can happen in any setting, right? Where the amygdala hijacks and you, and you feel like you're, you're out of control. But let's talk about this in relation to online disputes. So, there are definitely some benefits, right, to mediating online. Um, people don't feel as much of a physical threat. They don't feel like they are, they are under attack. They feel like they can speak up and not be quite as afraid. Um, typically, people are more comfortable because they're sitting at home in their sweats and their bunny slippers. And so they are typically starting from a place of, um, of, of being a little bit more relaxed. What people have noticed can I share a whiteboard? Yeah. Okay. What people have noticed is that when we were face to face, and, oh, I don't like that color. There we go. When people are face to face 
and they would start to get triggered, that it was kind of this gentle rise of, I'm starting to get a little upset. Okay, I'm starting to feel a little afraid. Okay, I can still look out the window and see that things are all right. And I can still see my mediator and see that they are calm, but I'm, I'm starting to get a little upset. But when, so this is the face-to-face, face-to-face. But when clients are online, again, they would start off a little bit more relaxed and it would, it usually takes a little bit more for them to get triggered. But what psychologists have found is that when they get triggered, they escalate very quickly. And I think the reason why is because we don't have as many, we don't have as, um, as much stimuli. We don't have as much context. We don't have a window here that we can look out of and know that everything's okay. We're not getting up and walking around. Instead, we get this tunnel vision where we're just focused on this one square. And because your eyes aren't always looking around and looking at other people and recognizing the space, you start to feel like the walls are closing in, right? There's, there's something in your brain that, that feels this sense of anxiety, that things are not okay. Um, so uh, I'm, I have become a horrible flyer. Something about as soon as I had kids and I realized, oh my gosh, like it would be bad if, if something were to happen to me on this flight, I've become an awful flyer. And so now whenever there's turbulence, I'm the one who's, who's putting my foot on the imaginary brake pedal and I'm holding on to the hand rests. But the main thing that I do is I turn and look at the flight attendant. And if I can see that the flight attendant is fine, this isn't bothering her or him at all, this is normal. Yep, there were some bumps, I just spilled all the water, but it's okay. Then I know things are okay, right? And when we're in a face-to-face -face environment, our clients can do that. They can constantly be looking at you and seeing, okay, you are calm, you are fine. That means that the clients feel like they can trust enough that we will get out of this conflict alive, things are going to be okay. When we're online though, we don't, have, um, we don't have as many clues. We don't have as much context or as much connection with our clients to be able to let them know, hey, we're okay. We're not going to crash. This is all right. It's just a conflict. We're going to get through this together. So realizing that when I start to see that my clients are getting triggered, okay, and usually that's I see their eyebrows come together, right? Or their cheeks are flushing, or you can hear it in their voice, right? That their voice, um, I call it the, the TARDIS technique. If we have any Doctor Who fans there, this stands for time and relative dimension in space. Meaning that I can tell my clients are triggered when there is less time and less distance in what they're saying, okay? So there is less time um, in their comments and less space. An example would be, um, I just don't understand why you have to take the kids. Like I always get the kids. How come you are taking the kids? The kids are uncomfortable with you. The kids are going to feel safer with me and I just need to be able to take care of my kids. Do you notice that, how, how you could watch that that escalation just skyrocket. And so, so that's a clear sign to me that my clients are getting triggered and I need to jump in quickly. All right. So when you can see that your clients are getting triggered, right? You can hear the difference in their voice. You can see how they're leaning in. You can feel their shoulders close in and you can just tell this is when, again, I need to, I need to step in and do something about this. And what that normally, and this is where I'd love to, um, and again, it could be a lot of things. It could be that they're upset with the other client. It could be that they feel like they're not getting heard or their sound isn't working. So things feel unfair. Um, where, oh, you know, I'm just going to go back to whiteboard. That'll explain it here. So then what I typically do is first I will send them into a breakout room. But I also try to connect with them in another way. Okay, so if um, when we were face to face, then we might try to get up and use the whiteboard or I would pull out a notepad and I would draw something and I would do different things. 
okay? To, to help your clients to re-engage, to help them to relax, to help their prefrontal cortex to come back. I can't, I can't move around quite as much now, but I still have a lot of options. So um, when clients are feeling triggered online, take advantage of the options that we have. The first thing again, um, and I will ask my clients to annotate because this is forcing them to access the creative part of their brain, which helps those feelings of anxiety. I'm feeling triggered. I feel like things aren't fair. Um, it, your brain is, is de-emphasizing those feelings of, oh, things are unfair. I'm out of control. And instead, your brain starts to get creative and it focuses on the creative part of your brain. Um, I, uh, I think that we've talked about this before, but, but um, in case you have, oh, and another thing is I will often just take a break. Let's go get some tea. Let's, let's relax. Um, so what I would like you all to do right now is to practice this. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, you'll either need to bring your mouse to the bottom of the screen or the top of your screen until you get a menu. And on the right of that menu, it should say more, or it might say view options. Do you see that? So uh, probably bring your mouse to the top of your screen, slide it to the right. And if it says view options, click on there where it says annotate. All right, yeah, Sheila. Sheila, I see your hand up, but I'm not hearing you. It was a mistake. I was, I, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. I didn't tend to take my hand off. That's fine, that's fine. Okay, so are you able to annotate? Do you see where it says annotate? So again, what I usually do, I bring my mouse to the top. And then it says view options and there I can click on annotate. Do you see that? If you're not seeing it, let me know. We can't, we can't annotate because uh, we cannot share the screen. Well, you don't need to share the screen. You should be able to annotate on mine. You, you, you can. Okay. So the reason why I'll often have my clients annotate, like I said, it accesses the creative part of their brain and it just helps them to take a breath. It helps them to feel like they're re-engaged in the process. Um, so I'd like to ask all of you, why don't you put a note or a little check mark by any of these things that you have tried that have worked or just add to the list. What have you done? when your clients are starting to get really upset, when your clients are becoming triggered? What have you done that, um, that helps them to stay engaged? So I've mentioned a few things here with Zoom. I use a breakout room, I use whiteboard, I use annotation, or I might take a break. Um, I also really try to, to just remember that we, we need to see mediating online as this great opportunity. So I might give them some homework. They're sitting right in front of the internet. So maybe research something or look up um, a child custody calculator or something that, that gets them involved and feeling like they're designing the process. And again, just realize you have access to the entire internet right here. Let's use it. Let's, let's um, again, we're not trying to take the face-to-face -face process and squish it into Zoom. Instead, let's make this a much more involved process with your clients where they feel like they are actively 
looking for answers with you and they are actively going out and finding terms for the agreement. There are so many model agreements out there. If you're doing a divorce, you can just Google what's a divorce template and look up a hundred different ways to resolve things. Why not let your clients do that? If you're meeting with one in a breakout room, give the other one some homework. Let's look up some templates. How has this worked with other people in your situation? And again, when, when people are there looking, it releases some of, the, some of that dopamine. They get excited about it and they feel involved and they're enjoying this process. And that helps your clients to stay fully engaged so that they, so that they have enough momentum to, to make it through to the end, right? Because this can be kind of hard and exhausting stuff. And um, so I, I, I guess that's the main way that, that's the main thing I want to talk about with this section is just realizing that, that this can be exhausting for clients and it can be exhausting for us. So how can... How can we first make sure that we're taking care of ourselves, but also how can we check in with our clients enough? How can we realize that, that they're just getting exhausted or they're feeling triggered and perfect. And so we will ask them more questions or, or use, use some of the online dispute resolution calculators or tools that are available. Um, yeah, so that, so that this becomes a, a much more involved process for them. Um, so does anybody else have any things that they've tried that really work when your clients are getting just very upset online? You can just unmute yourself and jump in. Juwan, what do you do? Well, um, till now I've been using breakout rooms mm -hmm. to talk to them um, and i'm looking forward to a time that uh, technology will allow us to have some e-coffee <laughs> that we can actually taste <laughs> so well right up, up to now i've been using um, breakout breakout rooms mm -hmm. but it's going to be for a very very short one because Usually, if I sense a problem, I'm not the only one who sense the problem. Yeah. And I need to, um, when, when I notice there's some escalation, I must stem it, then try to find a way of de-escalating. Mm -hmm. And when somebody is going from zero to 50 and then going to 100, usually the other party too um, yeah. is getting upset. And uh, if we are not careful, it's a very sensitive time that we can easily arrive at a deadlock. Yeah. Which sometimes was present preventable. So it's to quickly stem and de-escalate. Um, I'll see whether I can get, well, I'm going to find a way of trying it. Maybe if we engage them in something else, but for yeah. now it's big for us. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Josephine. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I would also normally use um, breakout rooms, mm -hmm. but at my last session, which was about two days ago, um, I had one of the parties, um, you know, she got really emotional and broke down completely. Uh -huh. And um, I made an attempt at um, using the breakout room, mm -hmm. um, but she was so um, emotional that she wasn't even going to listen. Um, to take instructions mm -hmm. on how to just join the breakout rooms and all of that. Oh. Uh, and unfortunately, her solicitor didn't join her on the day. Um, so the only option I had was to uh, adjourn the session. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to have another date. And, you know, okay. that will then have given her enough time and all of that. So immediately we had to adjourn the session yeah. because the break wasn't to work, the breakout room wasn't going to work. Um, so I got the case manager involved and what we did was to adjourn the session, mm -hmm. added short adjournment. Smart. So that was just another strategy. And um, yep, and I have really found that, that when clients escalate or become triggered online, again, if we don't, if, if they're not giving you some clues 
early on where you can jump in and do something about it, then they do. It's like they just escalate so quickly that sometimes there's no, there's no saving the session. Um, and because if we're face to face, well, I've already driven all the way over here. I took time out of my day. I have already invested in this. And so it's harder for me to walk out and it's harder for me to reschedule. But when I'm online, you know, all that I do to end this session, press the button. So I'm not as invested, right? It's a lot easier for clients to click away. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why I, I'm, I do, I'm probably spending too much time on this. I've just really noticed that we, we have to be much more aware of our clients when we're online and really checking in with them, really making sure that they're staying engaged, using a lot of these features um, so that, yeah, so that they don't just skyrocket and click off. Um, here are some of the other ones I use. I really like using polls, even if it's just with two people, sometimes just using that Zoom poll feature, it's just a different way to connect with them and it's helping them to, to um, prioritize the issues a little bit differently. So, um, so I, I think it's, I kind I feel like it's our duty. It's our responsibility to become comfortable with some of these different tech options. Um, what are different things we can use to sign documents, different calculators online for monitoring child support or different polling, you know, what are just some different tools that we can use online? But also, as I, the final thing here is just normalizing it, that we're all trying to figure this out and I'm going to make it as comfortable as I can, but I'm still figuring it out too, right? So, so I think we're kind of setting a standard here that, um, that this is a new process and we're figuring it out together. And I think the more that we can be transparent with our clients about that, then again, we're setting the standard for the type of communication we want to see from them. Um, I'm being humble. I am acknowledging that, you know, I'm, I might mess up here and I might throw you into the wrong breakout room and I'm sorry, but I, I really will try to figure this out. And we are figuring this out together. And um, go ahead, Juan. Yes. Um... What Josephine said reminded me of something. Um, usually at the start, and that is when they come in with their lawyers or with other people. Mm -hmm. I try to um, make the lawyers feel really important that I'll be relying on them to solve. Absolutely. Yes. So when I have such a situation, I solicit the assistance of whoever they have come with. To tell you the truth, it's not that I'm wild about these lawyers because mm -hmm. many of them uh, slow down things. Mm. Yeah. But it does help when there's more than one of us um, trying to calm a party down. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep, good, good, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's preempting such a situation by making the lawyer feel important and making them feel that's they are great. the ones that are going to help me yeah. solve this problem. That's great. Usually they are not, but I guess say that too. But if if you make it clear that's the kind of behavior that you expect, then I, you know, usually people will fulfill your expectations. So if you expect them to be difficult and make the process more uncomfortable, then they will. But if you make it clear, okay, we're in this together and we're going to, we're on the same team here then I, yeah, I, I love it. Then I think you're, you're setting up, you're setting yourself up for success. Is that what they say? So, um, okay. So let me do a quick summary here. The, the big things that I'm hoping that you can walk away with are first making yourself a priority so that when you go into meetings, you do feel like you can be completely present there. Giving yourself 10 minutes in between meetings, taking the time to go on a walk, listen to a favorite song, something like that. Again, because if at the end of the day, you have nothing left, then your clients aren't going to really be getting what they deserve, right? They need somebody who is, who's full, who is, who is replenished, who has, 
who is full of exciting ideas and can be completely present with them. So first, really set some time aside for yourself. And then second, when you can, it sounds like we can't always do this, but when we can, keeping those, those sessions a little bit shorter and a little sweeter, being more aware of, okay, is my client disengaging or are they becoming too triggered? And if so, what can I do about that? Should I do a breakout room? Should I do a whiteboard? Should I annotate? Um, maybe share a funny video or take a break or have them go research something. But realizing that we have tools to combat this and, um, and, and normally normalizing this, that, that this isn't an unfortunate thing, that clients aren't getting less because they're mediating online, but instead we have all these opportunities now. Gosh, we can sign an agreement in 10 minutes and I can just throw up the agreement and we can remote control sign it and be done. Isn't this fantastic? Um, because I've had a lot of clients say, oh, I just feel like I'm getting the short end of the stick because we aren't able to mediate face-to-face. -face. Well, but think about all the opportunities that we do have. And so if we let clients know, no, this is an opportunity, this is great. There are lots of benefits from mediating online. Um, and then the, the final yeah. thing that I wanna say here is just remembering to meet them through the screen, right? That instead of letting the screen get in the way, just remember to look through the screen and just, just let your clients know that you're listening and that you care. Again, I, I think that's where the, the magic of mediation comes from mm -hmm. is that clients know somebody really cares about them. Okay. okay. Can I say one more thing? I, I noticed that Kabiru from West Helena Hawk was raising her hand. Uh, it might be nice to hear the Kenyan- I would love to. Experience, yes. Uh, she was raising her hand, and um, I'm not sure you noticed. So please, can <laughs> you okay. call on Oh, her. thank you for pointing that out. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, Claire and uh, uh, team from ODR Africa Network. Uh, Wangari here from Wasiliana Hub uh, in uh, Kenya. And uh, uh, thank you for this session. Uh, most of all, because um, the, the opportunity to uh, mediate virtually actually came in for us, let me say for, for most of us with the COVID season, which of is course. now from last year. Mm -hmm. And that's when, yeah. Uh, and um, what, what for me I have experienced is that one is that there's a lot of telephone communication beforehand. Um, wow. and, 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 and actually like even I'd say uh, a lot of the pre-sessions, it's more like telephone versus on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, then um, the other side of it is uh, because Wasilena Hub, we are we drive a lot of uh, community mediation, and so uh, we are actually dealing with uh, persons who we, who are not necessarily even having the smartphones, and sure. so we we have seat or smartphones or even uh, laptops, computers um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a basic, and mm -hmm. so we 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 are, we are having to uh, situations whereby some some of them are using uh, cyber cafes. Sure. Um, that mm -hmm. are in, 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 in their areas to be able to, to, to have the sessions and also because we can't move around um, as easily as, as before. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, things to do with privacy considerations uh, coming in mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's, it's, quite, it's taking quite some time to arrange for a session. Uh, mm -hmm. Before it was, you know, I mean, let's say yeah, next week, but one on this day. So it's actually taking quite some time. But mm -hmm. something I've appreciated that you've, you've talked into, and I think for us as mediators is quite useful, is being able to understand the human brain. For me, that becomes a continuously important area for yeah. mediators to understand just how the human brain works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, especially now that we are uh, yeah, not face to face, even ourselves as mediators. Um, I like your uh, bringing in the context that we actually need to make the sessions shorter. It hasn't necessarily been a very deliberate thing for me um, in uh, um, mm -hmm. sessions that I've handled online, but I, I can relate that somehow the sessions were not as long as yeah. uh, before, uh, as, uh, as before, but then they were several. Right. So instead of the usual sitting for, let's say for three hours, they were, um, there were several. Yeah. So those are my, 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 my comments. Um, I think there's quite some uh, work for mediators to do, to be able to learn, you know, how to make best use of these um, online tools that are there. Because I mean, a platform like Zoom already has so much 
um, that we can use to support our clients and make them comfortable. So it actually mm -hmm. starts with mediators firstly becoming more comfortable with this tool um, in itself and then being able to pass that on to the clients. So thank you for the discussions. Asa, oh, Ante. thank you. Thank you. That's so useful. And I'm sharing a link right now in the chat. I, I might have already shared this with you. I apologize if I have. Um, but this is where I put all of the best resources that I hear about. So um, examples of confidentiality that talk about what to do when there might be somebody who's listening. For instance, if you're in a cyber cafe, um, uh, what to do with that information to make sure that it's not shared. Uh, some great trainings here. And we've put together a couple trainings for clients Again, just short videos that just say, hey, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, this Here's a white paper that just describes the process. So anyway, if any of these are helpful for you, please use them. And if you have come across any resources that you think would be valuable for others, uh, please let me know so that I can add them to this page as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going a little bit over here. Um, do you have any other questions or anything we should talk about? Um, oh, Josephine, you're muted again. Okay, sorry. I didn't say thank you very much. Again, this has been um, very insightful. Um, I recall we had you in November last year mm -hmm. and, you know, it's been really exciting and interactive today, um, an interactive session. Um, so I don't know if anyone has um, questions. Um, I mean, it's been really nice also listening to Angari mm -hmm. on the community mediation. And I was just thinking that um, with the use of the cyber cafe, um, do they have issues relating to cost, um, especially where people have to complain that they have to stay there for so long? Um, Wangari, do you, have you had issues with um, some of the parties complaining and dealing with the issue of cost? Where they have to use the cyber cafe. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, Justin. Hi. Um, okay. I, I think they, they, there's a whole uh, spectrum of issues that we need to start looking at on this side of the Sahara when we are talking about the virtual mediation. Uh, so uh, yeah, at present, I have I have one uh, case that uh, has not been able to move uh, for about uh, three months, and yes, the the cost aspect is an issue in in terms of uh, one being able to uh, to find that uh, cyber cafe for one of the parties, being able to find that place where mm -hmm. they can be able to get uh, these services. And then also the area they're in, uh, yeah, there was a young, there's a young man with a smartphone, but then the connectivity is not strong enough right. to hold. Uh, we will not, we, we won't say that they will move to or at this time because um, in the, the countries on uh, lockdown in some sections, um, um, you cannot be able to uh, travel uh, out in and out right. of some sections. So I think those are some of the things that we need to be alive to. And thank you, Josephine, for pointing this out. We really need to be alive to this because, yes, for me, it works at, at this juncture that we can set up a Zoom call and be able to do it. It also works for um, uh, one of the, the, other, the other parties. But for you know one of the for one of them it totally doesn't work completely, um, and so with like this case yes I've had a lot of telephone managing by telephone um, really in um, in this time, and with that it just uh, help it, it has helped to manage let me say like one part of the issues, mm -hmm. but then there are several other issues that would need them to be on face to face. So I think that's that's a very important query, and then also the recognition that. Um, our cyber cafes are not private. We, we, I mean, hardly, right. we, yeah, we, we, we cannot get them. They are cubicles, you know, desk to desk, eh? yeah. like in our, in our schools, classrooms. Eh? And, uh, and so it's actually a tough conversation. Um, and there's one that we had and we actually now, uh, they, well, they go to this, they went to the cyber cafe. Then I had to explain to the cyber cafe person that kindly, if you can please open one hour before. So we were doing it at 6 a.m. before they open at 7 so that the person could be just the only one there. Um, I think the other thing that we're tied to this, and I really thank you, Justin, for picking on this, is that it's really causing us as mediators to really be empathetic mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's not about us. Yeah. You know, right now, if the consciousness, it's not
about us. I mean, really, we have to be very, that extra, I just, you know, so from Kenya, to that are working with, mm -hmm. back to another context of whether, is there an opportunity of causing mediation a bit more expensive? When I say expensive is because the mediator's time is, you know, there's, there's actually much more time, whether it's managing the technology or mm -hmm. coordinating the teams. I don't know what that, what's Claire's experience around that. I think that may be worth uh, yeah, being able to get to know the difference also in charging um, fees, uh, uh, physical versus virtual. Mm -hmm. Yes, but yeah, thanks Justin for Okay, that. thank you so yeah. much, Wangari. Um, Claire, from what you can see, I'm sure you know that um, we certainly could, could go on and on and on and <laughs> on. But like you said, we've really gone way past our time. It's about 6.15 and we yes. ought to have ended the session at 6 p.m. Um, our time here in Lagos. Uh, so we just want to say a big thank you, Claire. Uh, oh, we have no doubt you. that, you know, we'll be delighted to have you again. Um, ODR Africa will be in touch and we'll look forward to having you again at another um, great session. Thank oh. you very much for your time. And a big thank, thank you, you for, to everyone who has um, taken time out to join in. Yes. Um, from our friends and colleagues from Kenya, we appreciate you. And we look forward to, um, you know, the opportunity to collaborate in many other areas. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, Abiola. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful Thank to you. see Bye. all of you. Come Bye. 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 Hi, thank you very much.